So this lecture is an introduction to gene expression. And the point of this lecture is to give you the tools that will enable you to practice transcription and translation exercises. There will be a different lecture on the mechanisms of transcription and translation. So this is just an overview so that you can start working on practice problems. So the first thing I want you to remember is the idea, let's go back here, of, it's going to do it again, genome versus proteome. And I know I go through this over and over because it's such an important concept. So remember your genome is your genetics, it's your DNA, it's all your stored information at the DNA at the molecular level. Okay. Every cell in your body has the same genome. Of course that's not totally true because cells get mutations, but in general your genome is the same. The proteome is which genes are, or maybe I shouldn't say which, let's say the, ge the genes that are expressed in a cell. And what we're going to talk about today is gene expression. So how do we go from genome to proteome? So the central dogma of gene expression is that there's a flow of genetic information from DNA to mRNA to polypeptide or protein. The mechanisms or the process of these steps, DNA to RNA is called transcription, and RNA to protein is called translation. You've got to memorize these terms. You have to keep them straight or you will not be successful on the quizzes and exams. Okay, so the way I remember this is that transcription basically means copying. Okay, so a long time ago, there were people who transcribed and they copied, say, Bible verses and proclamations and other important documents over and over and over. And that's all they did was copy them. And they copied them in the same language. That's what transcription is. When you copy your notes over, because I'm sure you're all studying plenty hard, you're transcribing. Okay. Some of you are able to speak multiple languages. And you know that when you go from one language to another, it's called translation. So this step is going from nucleic acid language to amino acid language. Totally different languages. We're having to translate the information versus just copying, which is transcription. So think of a way that you can remember this and keep these two um, processes straight. We'll talk a lot about these terms genotype and phenotype when we get into our genetic section. The cool thing is, remember that genotype looks like the word, it's kind of confusing, genetics, and phenotype starts with a P like the word protein. And it's <clears throat> primarily our proteins that give us our phenotype. And yes, fats and um, Carbohydrates also do that, but 
proteins, remember, are the big ooh, doers in the cell. They make things happen. All right. So when we do transcription, we were only copying a gene. So we're not going to copy an entire chromosome. Transcription is copying a gene. And so what is a gene? So a gene is a small part of a strand of DNA. And by most people's definitions, a gene codes for a protein. So we've got our DNA to RNA to protein. We have transcription and translation of a gene. Okay. The reason I say by most people's definitions is we're actually finding that there is genetic information in our chromosomes that code for functional RNA molecules. There are small RNAs, there are small nuclear RNAs, there are lots of types of RNAs molecules that have functions on their own that are not translated to proteins. But for this class, since it's general biology, we're going to define a gene as something that codes for a protein. Okay. And you have, humans, have about 20,000 genes. And so here is a picture of a chromosome a homologous pair of chromosomes. And so genes have locations on chromosomes because they are part of that DNA strand. And so on a chromosome you might have a gene for making eye color, and a gene for making earwax, yum, and a gene for your earlobe shape. And we'll get into some of this in genetics, but what I want you to understand is that when we're talking about transcription, we're talking about only copying this little bit of information out of this whole entire chromosome. The cool thing is, once you learn molecular biology, gene expression, the basics hold true for all types of cells. Okay, So prokaryotes and eukaryotes both do transcription. Oops. Ah. and they both do translation. So you remember common features of all cells, bacteria, eukaryotes, prokaryotes, plant, animal, however you want to categorize them. Everybody's got DNA. Everybody has a plasma membrane. Everybody has ribosomes for translation. And everybody's got <clears throat> cytoplasm or cytosol. I and mean, you can see that here. Some of the differences are that in prokaryotes, versus eukaryotes. Okay, in prokaryotes, transcription happens in the cytoplasm, where in eukaryotes, transcription happens in the nucleus. Right? And you know that prokaryotes don't have a nuclei, so they can't, or don't have a nuclei, don't have a nucleus, so they can't do transcription there. So they actually do all their gene expression in the cytoplasm. Another difference is what we call oops, RNA processing. So in the more detailed mechanism lecture, we'll talk about 
that eukaryotic, um, excuse me, eukaryotic RNA is processed. It actually gets parts of it chopped out. It gets a cap and tail put on. That does not happen in prokaryotes. It does happen in eukaryotes, and it also happens in the nucleus. Okay. Similarity, translation for both happen in the cytoplasm or the cytosol. So remember, the difference between cytoplasm and cytosol, cytoplasm is all the fluid within that plasma membrane, and cytosol is all the fluid minus the organelles, right? And since prokaryotes don't have membrane-bound organelles, they just have cytoplasm. Eukaryotes technically have cytoplasm and cytosol, okay? So we'll put these as... Well, same, they both have ribosomes, check, check, they both have DNA. They actually use a very similar DNA, uh, sorry, mRNA code. So you can actually translate prokaryotic genes just like eukaryotic genes. Something you'll do in molecular biology. All right. Basics of transcription. First of all, you need an RNA polymerase. ASE ending, this is the enzyme that copies DNA to RNA. We talked about another RNA polymerase, but we called it Primase. Right? So remember, primase copies little pieces of DNA during DNA replication so that the DNA has an RNA primer and the DNA polymerase has a three prime hydroxyl group to uh, start copying uh, or start adding nucleotides to. Okay. RNA polymerase, just like DNA polymerase, synthesizes RNA 5 prime to 3 prime. RNA polymerase, just like DNA polymerase, reads the DNA 3 prime to 5 prime, right? Anti-parallel. Everybody goes anti-parallel. Cha, cha, cha. RNA polymerase is this blue thing I outlined for you. And what's cool about RNA polymerase is it has helicase activity. It has its own. Okay, so remember in DNA replication, you have a separate enzyme called helicase that unwinds the DNA. Okay, RNA polymerase can also unwind DNA. It's part of the whole enzyme that copies the DNA to RNA. All right, so you know that DNA is double-stranded. So which strand does RNA polymerase copy? So we label each strand of DNA either coding or template. And in the um, next lecture, the more detailed lecture, I, I will explain to you that the coding and template strands can be either strand, depending on the gene. Okay, so don't get lazy and think, oh, the top strand's always the coding strand, the bottom strand's always the template strand. Guaranteed, I'll switch it around on you. Okay, but let's keep it simple for this lecture. And what I want you to see is that the template strand is the strand, strand that RNA polymerase copies. Okay. 
So our new polymerase is going to come in here and it's going to unwind. It's going to break these base pairs and it's going to start, and I just drew over it, oops, oops. Okay, RNA polymerase is going to come in here and it's going to wind, unwind and it's going to base pair. So it copies by base pairing, just like in DNA replication. And wherever there is a T on the DNA, it puts an A. And a G, it puts a C. And then remember that there are no T's in RNA. So, wherever there is an A in DNA, you put a U for RNA, right? So we have an A here, we copy it, or base pair it with a U. C and G and G and C and the same thing, T and A and A and U. So make sure when you're checking your RNA strand, it never has any T's. Okay. Everywhere you want to put a T, stop and write a U. So if you were able to cut and paste these, you would see that this one lays right on top of that one. It base pairs nicely. The strand that RNA polymerase does not copy is called the coding strand. But what's kind of cool is these are the same sequence, except wherever there's a U, I mean a T in DNA, there's a U in RNA. So sometimes you can cheat. And the coding strand is the same sequence as the RNA strand. But you have to understand that that's because of base pairing. RNA polymerase can't cheat. RNA polymerase can only read one strand. So let's look at that. Okay. So here is coding and template. Sometimes it says non-template. Excuse me, and that means coding strand. And what's happening is, well, that's rude. The RNA polymerase is this big orange bubble and it's base pairing with the template strand, U and A and U and A and C and G and A and T. And that's how you copy it. And you can see the RNA is kind of uh, uh, released. This chain is released out of the back end of the RNA polymerase. The RNA polymerase is copying five prime to three prime of the new RNA. And it's copying three prime to five prime of the template strand. Anti-parallel. Everything's anti-parallel. Everything's five prime to three prime. Okay, that in a nutshell is transcription. So if I give you a DNA sequence, and let's say I tell you it's three prime A T G C A T G C C T A, and I tell you this is the template strand, then you can go sweet RNA goes A and U and T and A and G and C and G and U and A, and it hurts your brain, but you can do it, T-A-A-U. Get in the habit of labeling your five prime and three prime. Always, 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 it's a great way to double check, and look, I'm anti-parallel, and I've got everything base paired. Transcription. Super. We make this RNA molecule, but we really want a protein. So to go to proteins, that's called translation. So this is taking the mRNA 
and translating it into a totally different language of proteins, amino acids. mRNA is read is let's say is translated in groups of three. Three nucleotides. Three whoops nucleotides equals one codon and that's going to code for one amino acid. You always read <coughs> the mRNA sequence, excuse me. <coughs> Don't worry too much about all this other information. We'll get to that in the next lecture. <coughs> Remember that translation uh -oh, is happening on the ribosome, okay? And the ribosome is going to line up these groups of three, and you're going to bring in a second kind of RNA molecule called a tRNA for transfer RNA. And the tRNA has an amino acid hooked to it. So when the tRNA base pairs with the mRNA codon, it brings in the amino acid. And then a new tRNA comes and base pairs with the next codon and brings in another amino acid. And what's amazing is for every group of three, there is a unique tRNA that brings in the amino acid. So how do you do this? Well, you need an mRNA codon table. <coughs> Excuse me. So, keep this handy. You get to carry around a periodic table your first half of the semester. Now you get to carry around the mRNA codon table. Right? So the codon are three nucleotides in the mRNA that code for one amino acid. Right. So if I have an mRNA codon, let's call it GAC, then what I do is I look on this chart and I start with the G's, first base, and I go over to the A's, second base, and I find GAC, and that tells me it encodes the amino acid, aspartic acid, which is represented by the one letter code D. Okay, You will always have this mRNA codon table. I like to do things by the one letter code because you can actually can spell out funny things sometimes, and it's much easier for me to grade than writing out these terms or even the three letter code. So we will be using the one letter code. You don't have to memorize any of this. Okay? You just have to be able to use it. So if I gave you the codon, well, how rude, five prime, two, three prime, and I gave you C, A, G, I'm going to give you a second to figure out what amino acid that codes for. So hopefully you're going C, I go over till I see the A's, then I find CAG, glutamine, Q. Okay. Again, <clears throat> we'll get into the um, molecular mechanism of this um, in the next lecture, but you should be able to take an mRNA sequence and translate it into an amino acid sequence. And just to remind you, we have about 20 amino acids. They have different properties, which we've talked about um, gives proteins their shape and therefore their function. So if you're wondering where all these crazy words come from, 
they're just coming from these different amino acids. Remember, an amino acid backbone is nitrogen, carbon, carbon, and everything in blue you see that's different, those are the R groups. All right, so let's take a look at this. One rule that we'll talk about more is that AUG is considered the start codon. So all proteins start with AUG. And you're going to see that in sometimes I will give you um, upstream information, and this is called the non-translated region. Again, we'll talk about that in the next lecture. And so you come in like a ribosome, and what the ribosome does is it sits here, and it scans, and it goes, A oh, AUG, let's start. That AUG starts what we call the reading frame. The reading frame is just the group of three nucleotides. Okay. So what I always do is once I find my AUG, I go one, two, three, 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 and oh, so on. Oh, and that should say three prime. I don't know what happened to that. I'll fix that in my notes. Oops. All right. If you look back at your codon table, you will see that AUG right here says methionine start codon. So the AUG, in fact, codes for an amino acid called methionine, but it's also the common start codon for the ribosome to know, okay, here's where I start my group of threes. The other thing I want you to know is that we have to figure out somewhere to stop. So there are three stop codons. Let's go back here really quick. UAA, UAG, UGA. Stop codon, stop codon, stop codon. Stop codons do not code for an amino acid. They stop tr or terminate translation. So when the ribosome comes here and it reads UAA and it knows that's a stop codon, the ribosome actually falls off the RNA. And even if there's a bunch of RNA sequence, stop, past that it will not translate. Stop means stop. So a a protein goes from AUG to the stop codon. That's called the coding sequence. for the mRNA. Now, sometimes I will just have you start the groups of three, depending on the problem, okay? And you can see if we did that, our groups of three would be totally shifted. One, two, three, one, two, three, right? And we'd have a totally different protein. So it's super important for the ribosome to find that correct AUG start codon and start adding amino acids. Again, we'll talk in more detail about the ribosome, but I just want to give you a peek. The ribosome um, is actually made up of two subunits that are two subunits that are assembled in the nucleolus, right? So ribosomes are made of RNA, ribosomal RNA molecules, and protein. They don't come together, the ribosome itself 
is not assembled until it binds an mRNA and actually finds that AUG. Okay, So normally we've got two subunits of the ribosome floating around <coughs> looking for an mRNA molecule. And then once it binds that mRNA, which is the yellow here, it starts finding that AUG and lines up the groups of three and reads those codons. Okay. This crazy squiggly thing is called a tRNA. The tRNA, I like to call it the translator RNA, but that's not technically its name, but it helps me remember it. This is the middleman. This guy reads the mRNA codon let's call it AUG, brings in this crazy other RNA structure. Let's do it this way. That has an amino acid on it. And <clears throat> the tRNA base pairs. So this would be UAC. 5' prime to 3' prime and anti-parallel, everything, base pairing and anti-parallel. Again, we'll go over this some more, but the part of the tRNA that base pairs to the codon is called the anticodon. So they're anti-parallel and they base pair. And so the tRNA translates, or it transfers the amino acid to the ribosome, and we can synthesize a string of amino acids called a polypeptide or a protein. You'll have this handout. I really like it. My um, colleague made this and I even printed it out in color for you because I just wanted you to see the relationship between all these sequences. right? So it shows you the coding strand and the template strand and the mRNA and the tRNAs base pairing with the mRNAs. And the tRNAs bringing in the amino acids that will eventually make a peptide bond at the ribosome. And you're translating mRNA into amino acid language. I think this is also a super pretty picture. Um, again, showing you the mRNA 5 prime to 3 prime. We'll talk about the EPA sites of the ribosome, but as the ribosome reads the next codon, the tRNA brings in the complementary anticodon. The tRNA is linked to a specific amino acid. We know which specific amino acid that is by the mRNA codon table. So in class, you're going to have a lot of practice transcribing and translating DNA and RNA. All right, that's it. Oh, one other picture I give you, gave you. This is kind of the whole big overall process.